Hi, everybody. It's so nice to be back. Um, we took a little break um, for a lot of reasons, but primarily to give space for the incredible social justice uprising that was emergent at the time. Um, and, uh, and I'm very glad to be back, but just wanted to start by saying that I hope that we can all continue to do this work. Of course, that is not over. There is justice that needs to be um, uh, um, accomplished on so many levels. So even though we're back, things are not back to normal. Um, so continue to do what you can a little bit every day helps um, no matter who you are. So I was just on the website, uh, justiceforbriana.org, which has a lot of ways that you can reach out easily on Twitter, emails, calls, anything. So just putting that out there. Um, but to the point, um, I'm so, so, so thrilled that these two incredible women are here and joining us. This is Chiza and Matari, and they are amazing writers. Um, and what we're basically gonna talk about today is, is writing audio drama. Um, we were all commissioned as a cohort to write audio plays before everyone was talking about writing audio plays <laughs> when the world shut down um, because of the pandemic. So. What a great um, uh, resource to have these wonderful plays, um, Madri's Evil Eye and Cheese's Proof of Love that are so beautifully produced and written and uh, amazing. Um, so big shout out to Audible Theater who kind of started to this like resurgence of audio drama. Um, so uh, I came to know those two plays through them and I'm so thrilled to have you. Um, so I'd love to just start uh, with a little bit of how you got to where you are and how you got to be who you are. Um, so if Madhuri, if you could start and just tell us, yeah, who, how, how, how did you get to be you? Oh, oh that's a lot. <laughs> um, uh, I, uh, I am a playwright. I have uh, been working uh, as a playwright um, pretty consistently since 2013. Uh, uh, just let me just go backwards. Uh, um, where 2013, I graduated from my MFA in playwriting at USC. Um, and I have uh, lived a bunch of places. I was born in the Bay Area. Uh, we moved to Singapore when I was six, and then we moved to India when I was nine. Uh, middle school, high school, college in India, all of that was very formative, um, informs a lot of the stuff that I write about and uh, lived in LA for six years before moving to Jersey City where I am right now. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it, you know, it, it was one of those things where I always loved writing. And I, when I was a, a kid, I used to write a lot of Harry Potter fan fiction and that's how I learned how to write. I learned how to write, yeah, no, I mean, I literally, I, I was just thinking about this this morning. It's like, I remember like, reading voraciously and just being mystified as to how stories were created. I had no idea. And then like when I was 12 or 13, you know, Harry Potter, the fandom happened and I started writing fan fiction and like my community helped me figure out, understand st structure and char character and storytelling and world building and all of that. And, you know, you know, it's, it's, it's a big, <laughs> it's a big influence on my life that specifically fan fiction and fandom and how you take something and make it your own. Um, which is coming in very useful right now, considering what's happening with the author, right? So indeed, uh, yeah, yeah. So um, and theater just kind of happened because I loved plays, and I just I I loved 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 plays. And when I was in college, I joined the dramatics club right away. But we were like an all girls Catholic school in India, and there weren't that many plays for an ensemble of Indian women. And so I started writing them, and I quickly realized that among all the roles that you can play a part in, in, in putting up a play. I liked writing the most. So that's kind of what I just continued to do. And it took a few uh, big leaps of faith to decide to actually actively study it and pursue it. And really, really glad that I did. And, you know, my family has a lot um, of, of credit due to them for helping me out and encouraging me. So yeah, those those are all the things that kind of made me who I am. Awesome, and I'm I here. love it. And now you're here and you yes. have a little baby too. I do have a baby and he's over there and you might hear him. So I will mute myself as much as possible. Babies are welcome. He, he's around, he's around. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. All right, Tisa, would you tell us some version of that same prompt? Yeah, man. Um, so many parallels, Madri, so many parallels. Um, I also was like a big word nerd growing up. Um, 
but you know, we didn't really have much of an arts program. I was in um, like the Newark public schools. Um, I grew up in Newark, New Jersey, piss poor. Um, never got to see a professional theater production even until I got to high school um, later on that though. But um, yeah, I used to just write, I, I read all the time and I would just write short stories because that's what, you know, that's what you know, that's, that's what you have access to. Um, and for me, theater was like, okay, yeah, it's just like, you know, whatever, a bunch of white dudes and tights spouting thee and thou and whatever, right? So, and it, and it wasn't until I got a scholarship to go to um, a private high school um, that I was like, oh, theater as a class. Oh, what? Contemporary theater. Oh, like black playwrights? What? Lorraine Hansberry? Like, you know, but there were not enough black playwrights, damn it. Um, and my theater teacher there, who was so cool, Mr. Pridham, I loved him so much. He passed um, a couple years ago, which was um, very sad for me. But um, he, among other things, um, like exposed us to like all, I mean, he took us to see early Julie Taymor work. Um, he took us to see um, Cabaret with um, Alan Cumming as the MC, which was like, oh my God, y'all, he winked at me and I just about dissolved. Um, and then, um, let's see, what else? He took me specifically to go hear August Wilson debate Robert Brewstein on the issue of colorblind casting. And I, my little mind was just like, what? Um, because of course I felt myself gravitating toward August Wilson's point of view, which was basically like, look, if you really wanna like employ actors of color, um, how about you tell stories about the, you know, people of color, like how, how about that? Like that, that just feels logical. Um, and I, 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 he, I heard that call <laughs> and I was like, damn right, August Wilson. All right, I'm going to write some plays. Um, and it's so funny because like, I didn't know when I was writing those short stories, like they were mostly dialogue anyway. Um, <laughs> and it wasn't until later that I figured out like, oh, this is you what don't, I've you don't have to write the other stuff if you don't want to just write the play. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to yeah. like describe the scenery for you. Like, <laughs> great. I'm just more interested in these people interacting and what they're doing. Um, so yeah, I started writing plays kind of in high school. I pursued it earnestly or as earnestly as I could at Vassar in undergrad. Um, but there was not really a play, I mean, most of the theater majors there, it's a big theater program, but like most of the theater majors are actors um, or directors. And I was the lone playwright in. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, I took like the one dramatic writing course that they offered at the time, which was taught by like an ancient screenwriter who was like, oh yeah, I guess you can write a play if you want to. And I was like, all right, cool. And then after that, I just did a whole lot of independent study and um, was sort of like, all right, I need resources now because I'm going to put up my thesis play. And they were like, okay, cool, here, take this money. And I was like, okay, great. Um, so that's why I loved Vassar. But um, I didn't really learn much about the craft of playwriting until I went to grad school, which was NYU Tisch. Ooh. All right, you, you, <laughs> yeah, you know. Um, so yeah, um, I didn't really learn much about the actual act of playwriting until until I, I studied with the folks there. Um, and yeah, and it's just, it's been, that's, that's where I'm at. I've since been awesome. writing plays and getting them produced here and there. And, um, oh, and, and TV and film stuff um, also. Uh, well, congrats on your new film. That seems like that's going so well. Yeah, and that was actually based on a play that there I wrote. Go. W, what? Look at it. Uh, so yeah. Um, awesome. Yeah. Oh, that's so great. I have so many in parallels as well um, to all of that. But the one I will just bring up shortly, she's like you, I was the lone playwright at, in undergrad. I went to Emory, basically had to create my own major, um, yeah. combining creative writing and Southern literature and theater. And like I was doing mime as well as <laughs> playwriting, which I made sense at the time. Sure, it's storytelling, limited resources, it's fine. Um, but anyway, uh, yes, so I think we do what we have to do and we learn as we go. We're like building a ship as we 
sail it, so to speak. So um, thank you so much for sharing that. I mean, I, let's jump right into audio plays. So I know that you didn't start out writing these, or I'm assuming you didn't. Um, so when Audible reached out to you, what was your first kind of thought when they were like, here's our pitch? And the way that they pitched it to me was a one or two person play. Mm -hmm. Um, that obviously works as a listening experience. Um, but I know Evil Eye has, I think, four, four, four voices. Yeah, five, five voices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's right. Um, so yeah, so how, how did you react to this idea? Were you like, absolutely not? Or like, I don't know what that is, or sure, let's do it. I mean, what, what was that um, for you? Madhuri, would you, would you start? Um, I was absolutely thrilled to get the commission. It came at a great time, uh, just in terms of like, oh, I'm, this is something I really want to do. Um, and, um, sorry, baby, but, um, this is part of the audio experience, right? <laughs> um, building up the world that I live in. Um, yeah, I, one of the first things I thought about when I thought it, oh, here's an opportunity to do an audio. For, well, it's interesting that Audible told you one or two person plays. They did not tell me that. Uh, so, so I, did, I didn't do it. I wrote a, I wrote a, a play with five characters. Um, and uh, I think it was also, they were figuring out what they wanted us as we went along. So, and I was one of the first persons to like turn in my play as well, just because they came to me at the right time. And I was like, yes, let's go, let's go, let's go. Um, I really wanted to write a horror play. Uh, and I'd been wanting to write that for ages. It was just a genre that I thought, why why can't we do this on stage? Uh, Disneyland does it, <laughs> you know, like haunted houses do it, right? There is, that's, haunt, that's horror theater, right, in a way, but why, how, how come I haven't really seen a very compelling horror play? And I'm sure there are, there are those out there, I just hadn't seen one. Um, and it didn't seem like a very popular genre. And so I thought, well, audio gives you the great opportunity to do something in this genre because with film, like, you know, the editor allows you to decide what you're gonna see or the director, right? The director decides what you're gonna see, what you're not gonna see. And that's part of what creates that feeling of dread and tension. Um, whereas in theater, you're just kind of, you're there, you're seeing everything. Um, whereas in audio, an audio play allows you to kind of like, you know, decide what you're going to listen to and what you're not going to listen to what you're what information you're going to get what you're not going to get and that is a great opportunity the other thing that that theater allows you to do is that you can't write a play that's about jump cuts and you can't write a play that's just about monsters it really has to be about what is the thing that you are most terrified of really in life and so it was like with the advantage of theater being like it has to be about characters it has to be about um, really, really deep primal truths, right? Um, combined with the format of audio was like, oh, this is a great opportunity. So that was the first thing that I thought of is like, I wanna write a horror play, um, but I didn't know anything else. Um, so that's kind of the, the initial impulse. And you know, just to jump in, what I love so much about it and why I think it works for horror is because my mind is making it scarier than any production yes. could make it, right? Like yeah. listening to it, when you know the voice changes just a little and you're like yeah. oh, I, I don't know if I trust him anymore <laughs> you know and then even like when you know fights and noises mm -hmm. of, of stuff happen I am yeah. building the tension yeah. in my mind it just works so yeah. perfectly for that I thought it was just really well done and I was not confused in terms of who was speaking and where they you yeah. know everyone felt like a full a full character to me yeah yeah so that's kind of uh that that was that was initially I was very excited yeah, yeah. what about you Tika? Madari, I love that you're like, yeah, yeah, audio play, whatever, no big. Let me make it challenging by like layering in like <laughs> this genre, this very difficult and distinct genre. Also, on top. I have I had never seen a scary movie before that. I hate really? scary movies. I hate them. <laughs> And so I was like, not only did I want to do this, but I do, was doing it in a genre that I didn't even like <laughs> consuming. I don't know why. Because anyway, but yeah, <laughs> it worked. But um, yeah, for me, like hearing okay, audio play was like enough of a challenge, and I was, um, but I was excited by it. I was like, okay, yeah, I can do this. Yeah, I can. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna write the shit out of this. Yeah, let's do it. So, oh, sorry, sorry, moderator. No, we're all good. This is the free internet. So, <laughs> but the baby. Okay, okay, I'm gonna. Okay, so um, the baby is cursing us all right now. It's fine. He's doing it in, in his own language. So, <laughs> so um, 
Yeah, I uh, was, again, excited by the challenge and um, by the vote of confidence that they were thinking that this was something that I could possibly do. Um, so uh, as someone who actually has trouble processing orally, like I can't, I have a hard time just listening to some, this is why Zoom is great for me because I'm like, oh, I can look at your face. I can see your expressions. I can, you know what I mean? Like this, mm. Zoom is okay. Like phone calls, sometimes I will like space out. <laughs> I've tried to listen to podcasts. I, mm -hmm. you know, somebody will say something interesting and it'll like send me off on a tangent, you know, a mental tangent and I'll be thinking about something else. And then eight minutes later, I'm like, oh, I shit, shoot. I just missed like eight minutes of the podcast. Um, so I really had to think of um, how I could write something that would um, work or appeal even to someone like me. Yeah. Um, um, and that meant no direct address. <laughs> um, it meant that I was really going to try to write a play and not just like, oh, a stand up routine that's been recorded or like a, a short story that someone is reading very, you know, nicely. Right. Um, so it, it meant characters, it meant dropping the listener like into a space into a scenario into a situation like that is happening in real time that is unfolding yeah. right here and you're just a fly on the wall like getting to sort of experience this eavesdrop right um and they did tell me one or two characters <laughs> um so that's what I, I, I that's what i went with and i actually um proof of love is just one character mm -hmm. I'm writing another one right now that's just two characters that that's two characters but yeah proof of love is just the one woman but she is talking to um her husband who is comatose um and just you know having some revelations and um you know about him and about herself and yeah and she changes from beginning to end and I, that i thought was um a really important way to um, to approach, you know, a, an audio play, right? It's like, how are the characters different? What changes? Um, do they get something that they've been wanting? You know, I mean, like the basic playwriting stuff, right? Playwriting 101 stuff, but you you only have, you know, you only have sounds and words to work with. And, um, and how did that, how did this only having sounds and dialogue um, were there any surprises? I mean, I, who, who tends to be watching this are writers. So let's, um, there'll be some questions um, uh, that I'll throw to you. Oh, you're getting lots of love online. They loved all your plays very much. Um, <laughs> um, but it's, it's interesting because I, I, I feel like some of the things that I had to check myself right away was so much of what I love about the theater are the unspoken physical moments where someone's mm -hmm. eye is a touch a you know a, an exit you know like a oh, you know I'm, am I looking at you am I not looking at you all of these um you know uh non-verbal uh mm -hmm. choices of course that's really <laughs> not not so much an option so what how did you deal with that um in terms I mean I thought both of you found incredible ways to justify why this is an audio play and to keep suspense and surprise and revelation and like the ding of that phone she's every time the message ding, ding, would kind of come up it was like oh no what's gonna happen next you know and and the the phone messages there's that one when 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 she didn't pick up um you know a couple times when the main character like it went to voicemail then it's like oh no, I'm worried, right? Stakes are rising and that's, you know, so how, were there things that occurred to you or lessons you've learned or advice you could share about kind of the specific tools you need for audio plays? Um, sound effects help. <laughs> <laughs> ding, 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 ding. <laughs> it's amazing what you can establish um, with just a couple of those, right? Um, for a hospital room, all you need, all you needed to hear to know that we were there and to sort of get the listener to paint the picture in their, you know, to get the picture in their head was like, okay, here's a heart, the sound of a heart monitor faintly yes. in the background and the ventilator, you know, um, and even like those moments that you were speaking of, of like, uh, there's some unspoken thing that's happening, right? Like even like this, the, oh, I loved our sound guy, like even, um, even though the obviously her husband is in a coma and he can't 
speak, right? Um, but his ventilator, it was it was subtle, right? But like she would say something that he might find upsetting, like if he could react and the ventilator would sort of like spaz out for a second or, you know what I mean? So just like little yeah. things, like it's really kind of amazing, like the little tricks that you can play um, to sort of compensate for the fact that you don't have visuals. Um, yeah, I don't know, pottery, what, what? <laughs> How would you say, what, what, what are the things you learned? I mean, I think for all of our plays, the, our audio engineers were amazing. Just amazing. the audio design and audio engineering was a whole, uh, um, world that uh, I got to uh, witness my uh, our audio engineer was Alex Trajano and uh, he was amazing he was just like he was he was you know it was me and Megan Sandberg Zakian our director and Alex and I feel like we were really a, a creative pod uh, of figuring out how best to tell the story um, you know it was interesting Chisa what you were saying about like how you personally relate to audio um, stimulus in your own life. Um, and that was very important for me too in, in figuring out what I wanted to do. So I knew, for instance, that I loved um, podcasts where people just chat. I loved, I love that. I have never been able to listen to a narrative podcast. I know that there are some brilliant ones out there, but my mind always wanders. The thing that some, for some reason keeps me entertained is when people are just talking. So I was like, okay, so I know that about myself. So what kind of play can I write where that it would, it would be something that I would actually listen to. Um, and uh, so, and then the idea of phone calls also happened and that was very much from my personal life because I moved to the States when I was 21 and my mom and dad live in India and I talk to them every day. So I talk to my mom every single day on the phone. Um, and it's just, uh, it's, just a, it's just what I do. And, um, because of that, that is the relationship that I have primarily with my mom is over voice, right? So, mm. so like Chisa, like you were saying, like it's hard to sometimes tell, uh, it's, hard, it's hard to communicate sometimes that way because you don't have your physical cues. You don't have context of the environment. You don't really know what the other person's doing while they're on the phone. And so that is also a very real thing that makes it hard to talk to my mom sometimes, you know? It's just in a, um, you know, it's frustrating sometimes. And so like all of that is very real. So I felt like, okay, this is the kind of audio world that I live in. So let's just bring all of that into the play. Um, so, you know. so it was just kind of like, you know, the I, I thought I love listening in on people talking. So let's just have like phone calls. Um, We're the nosy neighbors. <laughs> what's that, sorry? We're the nosy neighbors. We are, we are That's like, and it's like, it's such a fair. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I, I feel like, yeah, just, the, and so, and, and once I realized it was phone calls and the audio design of the whole thing also became much simpler, but then also it has to be very specific and very carefully done. Um, yeah, so that's kind of, uh, that's, uh, yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of where it came from. I, I feel like if I yeah, were, yes. if I were better, I could have like, oh, hi. <laughs> 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 Mine um, is not a baby anymore, but <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah. I, I have a quick question that is, is of this um, category. So many like, evil, I was so good. I love proof of love, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this is a, a question for Matt Hurry. Um, I was blown away by the tone of Evil Eye, how it evolved over time. Um, as that tone evolved, my composer brain couldn't help but notice some of the specific musical score touches um, that became more pronounced, if I'm remembering correctly. Can you talk about the function of musical score in this piece and how you spotted those moments? Or maybe you can provide some insight into your collaboration with your composer. Yeah, it was Alex Trajano. Um, and a lot of that work was really done by Alex and Megan, our director. Um, there was a lot of back and forth in terms of, is this useful, is this distracting, is this elevating the pieces? And I, I remember, I think the first time we actually hear music is during a long extended monologue by the mother where she's talking about something that happened to her a long time ago. So it's, you know, it's, <laughs> it's that's where we're kind of like, okay, this is a long thing. And hopefully the story is interesting. Hopefully what she's saying is interesting, um, but it did feel like it needed a little bit of um, support, production support. So. Yeah. That's, that was the conversation that we had around that. And then once the music was introduced, then it, then you kind of have to follow through a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that was just like really brilliant designing and dramaturging by our team, really just um, um, figuring out 
where it's helpful and where it's not. And, and I, I don't know. I feel like some, some people might like it. Some people might not. So it's just, mm-hmm. I think it comes down to a taste thing as well. Um, because, because everything in this world is very diegetic, right? Although you, everything you hear is part of the world and then suddenly you hear score. Um, but it's also the moment yeah. that the, the story is kind of taking a supernatural turn as well. So, you know, it's kind of, it's indicating something. That's how I felt it. It, it kind of yeah. lifted me in a, in a nostalgic kind of ethereal space, which a memory kind of lives in that way. So I, it, it totally yeah. worked for me. I have another question. Um, maybe Cheese, you can answer this. How uh, did the process of rehearsing or developing your audio play differ much from the process of rehearsing or developing a stage play? Oh, uh, yeah, my process was a little weird um, because it was produced as, it was produced live, like it was produced as a stage play before um, we got into the studio to record it. Um, But, ooh, man. Um, Well, first of all, I got to work with people who I I adore and with whom I have um, a, a pretty great shorthand. Mm. So the rehearsal process was um, was pretty smooth. Like the the actress who reads um, Proof of Love, she, I mean, essentially she didn't come in off book, but she, it, she was pretty wow. darn close, you know, wow. which is a a, a feat. Um, she does not mess about when it when it comes to. Um, you know, doing the work. Um, and so that's, um, I, I was very lucky in that respect that like, because she had such a, a strong foundation um, as far as just being able to access the words that um, she and the director and I, like we could all work um, more deeply, right? We could like really dig into, okay, well, what's what's the intention behind this? What's the history behind this thing that she's saying? Um, what's that what what's that dot 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 you know <laughs> where where she's trailing off like what is she thinking in that moment kind of kind of stuff so we were able to do some pretty nuanced work um in that respect it, again it just really helps to have a, a super professional performer who will come in and, and um already prepared right yeah um yeah it was so interesting because we like you we were on stage first and so and again I love the touches and the silent things and all of that and the stage play was able to, I honestly indulge in those. And then when we were in the studio, my director, GT Upchurch, who is incredible, basically said at a certain point, I just had to close my eyes. So I just, cause I kept wanting to look at the actor and I kept wanting to, you know, she loved this part where Kate Mulgrew did this or that with her, hey, her face or eyebrows or whatever. And just having to just kind of close your eyes and make sure the story was as clear that way mm-hmm. with your eyes open. And it's kind of that simple, you know, um, and I, I, I really appreciated, appreciate that. So let's see, um, a, f- a gentleman named Fred is asking, um, what are your opinions about writing stage directions to be read aloud as part of a performance, a narrator of sorts? Is that useful or distracting? I have, I have opinions, but I'd like to hear yours first. <laughs> Maybe, Chisa, would you, would you start us off there? Oh yeah, um, again, because again, I'm not really into, um, it's different if you've written a play, right, for the stage that is then um, being presented, um, you know, via Zoom or whatever, and, you know, you hear the, the stage directions sort of almost as a character in, in yeah. and of itself, right? Um, that's different. For an actual radio play, I'm not, I, like, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a bit of a purist in that I really I don't like the omniscient narrator vibe. Like I don't I don't like um, I do think it's distracting, and I I do think that it um, it pulls your listener out of the experience that you're trying to create, or at least at least in my case, like it's it's different. Again, if you are deliberately using you know that as a uh, a, a, a device or a, um, a framework, right? Um, but I don't in my work because I'm trying to create that voyeuristic experience, right? That of yeah. just um, sort of, oh, eavesdropping on this thing that's happening. Um, and I think that if I had a, a stage director uh, narrating that as it was happening, it would not be as effective. Yeah. Yeah, I think if, if you're going to have a narrator, they need to be a character, right? They, they mm-hmm. need to be like the, the narrator in Jane the Virgin. They need to have like a personality and a point of view and you need, yeah. need, you need a reason that they're there. 
because um, this is such a cool opportunity to create something for this medium, right? You know? Um, or you can just go Shakespeare and be, oh, I am stabbed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Straight up say it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm leaving the room angrily right now. <laughs> <laughs> There's the bear, yeah. gotta go. <laughs> Sorry, a bear just showed up, guys. Um, yeah, I think that's I think that's totally right. Now, I, I did another audio version to your point, Chisa, of a play of my Natural Shocks, which is a one-woman play. And there are a few moments that specifically read um, the stage directions, basically at the beginning and the end. Um, and that was just because I wasn't going to rewrite the play for that medium. And in that case, that is a play that has been recorded in this way, which I think is different than starting out going, I'm writing an audio play. Mm -hmm. And that I would say, don't rely, do the work. Like part of audio plays, how can you convey setting and time and exposition and all these things and action and movement um, without having somebody come in and being like, he leaves. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, Let's see, uh, there's another one. Oh, um, a gentleman named Michael asked, in addition to limiting the number of characters, did the folks also limit the length? I kind of limited myself um, to, I think my play is probably 70 minutes, maybe less. They wanted, they wanted mine to be longer. Like, oh, really? or, I mean, like, or they didn't want it, but like, it was, it was, so I didn't know anything. I didn't know that there was an opportunity to also have the play staged. You know, I didn't know that was part of the commission. I thought we were just writing <laughs> radio plays. So I was specifically like, no, this could never be a stage play. The whole point, after I wrote it, I was like, really? This could have been a stage play? Well, it's not gonna be a stage play. because I didn't it think could. It, it could totally be a stage play. But that's not, you know, that's not how I anyway. thought about it. So I yes. didn't want to pursue that. And I also didn't know that it could be like anything. Like, I also didn't know that, you know, the thing is like most people who use Audible as a service like downloading very long books and listening to very yeah. long books. And so, right. This didn't have to be a 90 minute play, which is what I'm, I tend to write. Um, but then, uh, so because of that, I had conceived of it as a 90 minute play, but it actually, if we wanted to go wild and write an epic, then I think they would have been pretty happy with that. Yeah. Yes, I was just doing my normal like, no intermission, like 90 minutes straight through kind of a, kind of a vibe, which is how I tend to write anyway, <laughs> ideally. Um, Maybe for a second we can chat about the actual writing, like how you tackled the writing. And I think the main point, um, Cheese, you said this earlier, it's a play. So like write a really good play. <laughs> That's, there's no special category. Um, I mean, both of you wrote incredible stories that I think could easily live on stage um, in, in, with different levels of, of production. Um, and the truth is they were just gorgeous, stories where characters changed. We have this beginning, we have a big middle where something kind of everything is disrupted. She's it for you. It's that revelation of, of what her husband's been, been doing. Um, and, you know, the introduction of the backstory um, in Evil Eye and the, the gentleman that um, our main character meets. I'd say the mom is the main character actually, isn't it? Anyway, um, but uh, yeah, and then this great change and a big moment of kind of decision. I mean, specifically, I love the way um, the decision that we kind of don't get a full answer to at the end of Proof of Love, like, oh my goodness, what is she going to do? Um, but the, <laughs> the question is in the air, change has happened. We've been through a whole journey of revelation and understanding and unpacking feelings and um, mm -hmm. So is there anything that you, uh, yeah, how did you, how did you kind of approach this? Um, and maybe how did you decide uh, one character or five characters versus two or three or 10? I mean, how did you kind of make those playwriting decisions? Um, well, I actually had like a couple other ideas for plays before and, but I ran them by Amelia Lapenta and <laughs> even at Audible and they were like, um, yeah, okay. <laughs> no. You know, and it was just so clear that they were like not enthusiastic about them. So I was like, all right, all right, screw that, screw that. Then let me try this, right? Um, and so when I ran this idea by them, um, which I came up with because, um, well, it, TMI, um, my granddad actually um, got into an accident, a really horrific car accident, and um, was comatose for a little while. Oh. And then my grandmother had to decide if and when to pull the plug, um, which caused a whole lot of family drama, but that's like a whole other thing. So that was happening at the same time 
my mother um, was sort of, had just been through um, the ordeal of discovering that her husband, my stepdad, um, had been cheating on her for years. Um, yeah, with oh. the and, um, you know, and then and they were going through some stuff. And then he actually, just as they were maybe looking like they were starting to reconcile, he went out for a walk and his heart gave out and he died. And they didn't get to um, have that reconciliation. And she was left with all of these questions and um, really just, you know, just a mess, you know, this mess, this emotional mess to clean up all by herself. And so I, I kind of conflated the, those experiences into um, wow. this, the idea for proof of love. And um, yeah, I was just writing it with the hope, with the aim of getting some answers for my mom, wow. <laughs> which sounds weird, you know, but like, I just, I wanted to get some closure for her. Like I wanted to, um, to really honor her experience and to sort of sit in her sit in her, you know, and, yeah. and, and really try to feel what that must have been like and, um, and, and try to think of, well, what would happen? And what could, what could possibly happen? What could possibly be revealed, you know, or, or what could make this okay, right? Mm -hmm. Like what could, yes, what could make this okay? What could give her the closure that she needed? And I just kept you know, I started with, okay, here's a woman in a hospital room talking to her comatose husband. I started with that mental image. And then I was like, all right, now as what happens, right? And I, I just sort of wrote myself to, to some semblance of a logical <laughs> and satisfying conclusion, I hope. Um, but it's so interesting because even in that kind of, not that the concept is simple, but it's a, it's a simple premise. And it's, you prove so with such a captivating skill. I mean, you're an incredible writer. And so it just goes so deep in so many ways, deep and broad, even though it's one person in the same scenario for 60 minutes, something like that. Um, and we, I mean, all sorts of conversations about self and other and love and the title is so, you know, you, you, when you realize what that title means, um, and just, it's, I feel like I heard the husband and I feel like I heard this other woman and you did, you found this, such an interesting way to do that with one voice. Um, obviously you have to have a really amazing actor, which you certainly did. Um, She's so great. She is so um, good. Oof. But yeah, and I was trying to layer in um, because I don't do dysfunctional family dramas just because like, so I was really trying to layer in some like socioeconomic, you know, it's amazing. <laughs> like, um, um, I guess social import, or, or, you know, um, just some commentary about classism and um, and how and and intraracial dynamics because I feel like there's a lot of emphasis on interracial dynamics and we don't really get to just sort of um, look within the walls of the black community and like figure out what the hell is going on amongst us, right? Like we don't really get to just sit and and deal with that and confront that in any sort of meaningful way. And so yeah. I wanted to make space for that too. It was amazing. I never heard anything like that before. So now, Mattery, how did you approach your, um, like maybe like structure? Like, like what, how were you, did you outline the thing? Everyone asks about writing. Like, did you outline? Did you, which scene did you write first? When were you like, oh, I know. And um, yeah, how did you, how did you manage that? Yeah. Um, first of all, I, it's so cool. Like all of our plays have so many parallels. Like we were all, all of our plays are about women, like really cool women overcoming like crazy things. And, you know, I love that she said you wrote it for your mom because obviously I wrote Evil Eye for my mom. I think it's kind of, you know, it's kind of there. Um, yeah, uh, it was, it was, uh, I always outline um, that it just makes me feel better. And, and outline is usually just, this is scene two, scene two, this happens, scene six, that happens, and then this is how it ends. Um, and I didn't know exactly how it was going to end. I just knew that the philosophy of the play is that the mom's going to be right. So that was just like what I knew going in. It's like, mom's going to be right. Um, I'm sure your mother was like, exactly. Yeah, you know, it was Have like, I, you I don't, you know, because I, I feel like, you know, especially with 
when you're sitting down and trying to structure something or trying to figure out what the story is, you really need to know the why. You really need to know why you're writing it because that's going to be your, your pole star that's going to guide you always when you get lost. So if I knew that the point of the play is my mom is right. <laughs> um, uh, and just because I hadn't really seen that before and it was something that I feel could mean a lot to people um, to have just the older woman be right, you know? We don't often get that in stories. Uh, so yeah, so that, so I, it took me a while to figure out what the story was going to be. Um, uh, I, once I landed on the fact that it was going to be phone calls, um, I then realized that I had an actual transcript of a phone call that I had with my mother when I was in my mid twenties. Um, I had been trying to work on a solo show at the time and like every woman in her 20s was working on a solo show was going to be about my mom um and she had called me with the craziest phone call and after the phone call I just like wrote down whatever she said and I still had that word document so I thought that's going to be the first scene great so actually the first scene of the play is an actual phone call that I had with my mother when I was 26 um and it was wow. funny so so you know it was kind of I was trying to it was it was like that. so it started off in this way where it feels like a family comedy but then it's it doesn't um i uh and you know my husband asked me a very good question which is what what is something in indian culture that is uniquely scary do you have something like for instance a banshee in irish mythology do you have something like that and i was like i'm not really sure if we have like specific monsters but i think the concept of reincarnation is pretty scary if you think about it in a certain way um so so once that happened, it was kind of like, okay, this is the this is the story. This is what happens. Um, this is how it's going to unfold. And I don't know how it's going to end, but I know that the mom is right. So that's kind of how it happened. So I had like just right. a note, a, a, a never note note with like this. These are the scenes. But that's so um, smart. Yeah. Even knowing that, I think that's so many people, so many writers, tend to get tripped up mm -hmm. because you don't just say, "Here's what I know." Yeah. The, it's almost like the ending is too open-ended. You're like, well, I don't know what's going to happen. We're just going to figure yeah. it out. And like, no, the mom's right. Yeah. It's about a scary thing. This is the yeah. scary thing. Yeah. And here are, the, here are the players. And then I go. mean, I think you need to know, it's like, I also think about like, what are the politics of my story? Like, what are the things that I am uncompromising on? Uh, and then if you know those things, then it's, it's easier to at least figure out what you don't want to write about. <laughs> yeah. And then you just kind of narrow it down. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's great. And have it work for me. Um, and so let's see, here's some more questions. Oh, um, uh, Kasiemba says, totally got the impression that Chiza was writing from a very personal space. There was some fascinating dimensions of classism and perhaps colorism within the black community. Um, I totally agree. Um, uh, and uh, so Tracy's asking, once your piece was only audible, did you ever um, find knowing who was speaking difficult and were there strategies like um, using the character names or accents that would just help distinguish voices? Mine was pretty obvious, two ladies and Kate Mulgrew has a very distinctive voice. So you definitely know, I know who's talking. Um, Cheesy, you of course had one voice, but some voices within that in terms of how she was embodying other characters. Um, but yeah, do you have any thoughts on kind of how to make sure that the sound, I mean, I had no problem distinguishing the characters in, in, in yours, Madurisa. I mean, I think, it's, I think it's a very good question to just keep in mind in general when writing audio plays that you always, I don't know, no matter what you do, you have to write with the audience experience in mind always. And so, um, you know, I knew I knew that luckily just the characters had two very distinctive accents from the beginning. Like you have two younger people who are American and two older people who are Indian and then just one more extra character. Um, so the accents will help distinguish the voice, the tone, the timber, you know, I think. Um, for sure, I think it, it would be so much harder. It's a really good question because I think it'll be so much harder to write an audio play about two people of the same gender, age, race, social class, you know, it would be much harder because you will tend to sound similar to each mm -hmm. other. So do you want, if, if that is the play you're going to tell, how are you going to make it accessible and interesting and dynamic to the ear? Mm -hmm. um, is there really a really good question? So that's a great opportunity to make sure that you're writing plays about very different people. There you go. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> Diversity, yay! Yeah. <laughs> um, 
Chisa, how did you go about the idea of a character and her kind of the way she is imitating um, some other voices in her story? How did you how did you write that? How did you what was what was that like? Um, this is just <laughs> this is me. Okay, so having grown up super super poor. And then, you know, got into a place, I guess, I don't know, I guess I would be considered like solidly middle class now. But um, like my husband, for example, like he grew up solidly middle class and has climbed up, you know what I mean? Like, so it's, it's, I had to, whenever I'm around his family and his friends, I'm a little bit, I, I listen to like how they talk about people who are like I was, you know, or, or um, who grew up where I grew up, who grew up how I grew up. Um, and it's always interesting how <laughs> they, they flip that switch and, you know, and they could talk like this, you know, whatever. And they say X and, you know, oh, I asked her that already and la, 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 right? Like they can get real hood, like real ghetto, you know, and, and the way they do it is, is it's with such, um, they almost take a kind of joy or pride in the fact that they can like mimic, <laughs> you know, like the, the, the other. And I, and I do, I, I feel very much othered in those moments because mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, that's like my cousin, like, shut up. <laughs> you know? Yeah, right. Um, so yeah, I mean, it just, I wanted to to latch on to the delight with which um, a wealthier person might sort of break out of, you know, the that sort of prim proper um, facade, not facade, but like that prim proper um, shell or whatever, right? And and be and sort of put on a different um, a, a different voice, a different um, yeah try it on like a costume kind of a thing um, I loved it. yeah yeah I will say right now that you can we're talking about all these things and I hope you have listened to them if, if you haven't they are available on audible you can go listen and then rewatch this and you'll know exactly what we're talking about <laughs> um but uh, we we have like only 12 more minutes left which how delightful um is that there's been some really wonderful comments um one about um is there any way that audio plays can be accessible for the deaf community? And I have not thought about that, except for making the scripts available. I know mine is going to be published, and I think yours is, isn't it already, Chisa? Yeah. It, uh, is Evil Eye published in a readable form? No. It should be. It, it should be. be. <laughs> we should figure that out. Um, yeah. But I hadn't thought about that before. So thank you uh, to Barbie who. Anyone that up. who wants to read it, just email me. Like I'll yes. send you the script. It's there fine. we go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good, because I certainly wouldn't want them to miss on the the wonderful horror, <laughs> intimate horror. There, there were actually a few comments um, in the in the um, uh, audience review section uh, asking for the script. I think that could be really. Great. Like I yeah. think it'll be fun to follow along with the play while you while you read it too. Whether or not yeah. you you need it accessibility wise, it could be really fun. Yeah, I think that's that's a great point too. Um, and then Marilee, who I know, hi Marilee, love you. Um, she uh, asked, did any of you collaborate with blind or visually impaired artists who live in the listening space day to day, moment to moment? Which I thought that is an amazing idea to have to bring in those incredible artists as consultants because. Um, I'm sure they will know lots of things that I certainly don't. Um, I love that idea so much. Mm -hmm. And I'm definitely going to pursue that for my next audio play. So thank you. That's really, really great. Yeah, yeah I will um, connect y'all because, and Amelia. Amelia, you're going to get an email <laughs> about that. Because yeah, that's so brilliant. And, and certainly something that is, I hadn't thought of. So that's great. Let's see other questions that we have. Um, <laughs> There's a great, okay, let's see. Does Audible give a sense of how many audience, uh, audience, how many people are, are accessing it? Um, and I don't, I mean, I just know the like number of reviews, which I, there are lots, <laughs> which is lovely. I mean, okay, so maybe that's an interesting question. Um, in terms of work that when we work in the normal theater space, 
you have a run that lasts a month or so, and you have some numbers of hundreds or thousands of people that perhaps get to see it, which is incredible. Um, but this is like crazy for me to see like yeah. how many people all over the world. What does that feel like for y'all? It is bizarre, but really cool. Um, and it's a play. Like that's what like does my heart good because I'm, mm. as you say, right? Like play like live, the, you know, when it's up and the, maybe a thousand people, who you know, come, <laughs> come yeah. see in your 99 seat theater, you know, I don't know, right? Um, but when, when you can reach so many people with a play, um, oh yeah, like I, I, my heart, my heart. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I was talking to Kate Maven who reviews and I'm like, 9,000 people have heard my play. Like that's insane. It's so um, crazy. Not 9,000. I don't know. Maybe. Am I, I like think, I don't know. We have to check on the, it's also weird to have something that's up that people are constantly giving stars to. It's like <laughs> you do that once in the theater for reviews and you're like, oh God, why am I doing that? It's constant. It's like all the time. <laughs> but <laughs> I love it very much. And it's interesting. I was talking to Kate Naven, who runs the program, and she was saying that a lot of the people listening are from places that don't have, that they can't access the theater. You know, they have maybe have a community theater, but they don't have a lot of theaters. They don't have a major lord theater. They don't have Broadway touring. So in some ways, this is allowing folks who don't have access to theater to have some really good theater, you know, um, which I think is amazing. What was that like for you, Mary? It's awesome. I mean, I, 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 I think I was feeling the pressure as I was writing it because I knew that this play would have the largest audience that any of my plays would ever get just due to the nature of the medium. Um, and so because of that, I'm really glad that the play turned out well and that it's something I am actually proud of and stand behind because <laughs> that always doesn't happen. Okay. Um, you know, so um, yeah, I'm really, it, it's, it's very gratifying to read like the audience um, comments. Um, it's really great that I don't have to worry about being reviewed by a critic. Uh, it's just, you know, it's just kind of what people are genuinely feeling, which is a really wonderful way to get feedback. Um, yeah, it's great. I, I don't think Audible like gives us numbers or anything because it's it's tricky. Like I think um, sometimes the plays are free, in which case you don't know. Sometimes you have to pay for them, and some then you might be able to see right now like royalties or something but oh yeah if, if the model keeps changing so it's uh, i'm just glad people are able to it's just, you know it's so so many I, I feel like we all experience this so many times our friends or our family will be like can you send us a video of your play you know which is which is yeah. a very genuine question but unfortunately we can't like a play is so ephemeral you have to be in that city you have to be in that space you have to be there at that time to experience it um, how, however, now we have something that we can actually just send to our friends and family and be like, here, I wrote this, this is for you. You can experience it in the way it's meant to be experienced. Um, yeah, so it's really cool. I love it too. It was just, it is, it's so nice and different for us. I mean, you can read a script, but that is, you know, a script is in a play. <laughs> you know? um, so, and I will say now, cause there's a couple of questions about submissions um, to Audible or to other people. I mean, the truth is the first day of the first week of the shutdown, I just went in my basement and recorded my one, one woman play. Cause I was like, well, I am one woman and I have one woman play. I will just, I guess, record it. And found my friend works in, works in the audio space and found a great um, designer and editor and a um, technician to help me put it up and add some wind and all that great stuff. And I thought it was really great. So all this is to say, you can do it right now. You don't necessarily need Audible, um, as fabulous as they are. Uh, so I think now is a great time to experiment with this since we can't make theater as normal. But also Audible has the Emerging Playwrights, what's it called, the Emerging Playwrights Fund. And you can apply, anyone. Um, and I put, I'll put the link um, in the bio. You can also just uh, search the Emerging Playwrights Fund and Audible and um, submit. And uh, I had an amazing time um, working throughout the whole process. Um, but maybe we can talk for a second because uh, there was a question about kind of the idea and if Audible had a lot of say in you know, what we were writing about or how we were writing it. Um, and my experience was they asked to commission and then I presented a few ideas. And the one I think I was the most gushy about, which was like, okay, this happened. And you knew this about history? Did you know that Marie Curie did this? And oh my God, this, and then this. And they were like, okay, you should definitely write that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, but also, you know, my 
one of my things is like science history ladies and this is like solidly in the science history lady track. So um, anyway, so how did, how did your, um, what was your pitch to Audible or how did you um, kind of, I don't know, get them to be like, write that. <laughs> Jeez, you mentioned a little bit about that, that you were like, these ideas and other ideas that were, they were clearly just sort of like, oh yeah, okay, that's, um, it'll be interesting to see what you do with that. Mm. <laughs> you like, never want to hear interesting. Interesting is always bad. <laughs> yeah. I was like, okay, read the room, read the room. Okay. Um, and so when I came at them with this idea, and again, like you were saying, Lauren, like it's, um, they can tell, I think, when you've got some kind of, when you've got like a real deep personal investment mm -hmm. in the material that you're talking about. And so um, I said to them, okay, you know, like it's about um, this woman. And I'm like, on the surface, it's about this um, wealthy black woman who has just discovered that her husband's having an affair with, you know, this woman, this other woman. And, um, you know, he's comatose and she has to decide whether to pull the plug. Okay, on the surface, it's about that. But really it's about, right? Um, class relations within the black community and blah, 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 whatever. All, right? I mean, it's such a great pitch. Just like uh, even you don't even have to qualify like on the surface. It's such that's such it's, a great. Pitch. I know it's great. <laughs> that in and of itself. Yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> it's a little bit like you know. Okay, these are small, intimate problems that like, like on the one hand, okay, yeah, universal, right? Which it was kind of the point for me. It was like, okay, I need to take this, an experience that like maybe a lot of people can relate to mm -hmm. um, and, and then just sort of sneak in, <laughs> you know, fold in um, some, some commentary about, about um, race and, and class and stuff, mm -hmm. right? So, um, and, and that's the way I pitched it to them. And it wasn't just about like, okay, what happens in the play? play it was like what is the play about yeah, so I think great. as long as you know like at at its core what your play is really about or if there's some like deep kernel some some core thing right some beating heart um inside of whatever it is that's happening in the play I think that that's probably what's going to make them go oh okay we're intrigued we're listening yeah. and go on right yeah. totally how would you answer that, Madhuri? Did you have a? I, I didn't pitch at all. I, <laughs> I had a different experience. I don't think I don't think so. I don't remember it. I might I could go back into my emails. I think I just wrote the play. Um, <laughs> and you were just like, and then I, I sent and then it. I sent it to them before the contract was done. Yeah, yeah. I this never happens. I procrastinate like crazy. But I had a I had a deadline anyway for, um, for the new play program that I was in. So I was like, let's use this deadline to write the play for us. Let's go. Yeah, so I just I just wrote it and then I and then they sent it to them and then after that they were like we're thinking of one to two person plays and like nope that's not it's not what I sent you <laughs> so the but they were fantastic that is they were so great I had, we had the most wonderful new play development process it was very traditional like in terms of the traditional new play development thing you know there was a great workshop and a reading and um, Emilia um, was uh, one of my primary dramaturgs and she was incredible. And uh, I, I got to work with the same director through Megan. So it was it was a, a, fa a fabulous experience. They never once put any sort of constraints on what we what I wanted to write about. Yeah, I think that's great. It was only like advice that I got about here's a few things that we've learned. Yeah, in yeah. General by doing this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, I, I felt very loved and supported. Even like when I went all theatery and stuff, like there's a monologue I set underwater and they were like, cool, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which is great. All right. You know, we can, you can really kind of take, do some sweepingly theatrical stuff. Like it doesn't need to be kitchen sink every time you can be poetic. I think let's, let's use this time to prove how like the diversity of stories and aesthetics that can live on an- Can I ask you a question, Lauren, really fast sure. about your play before we wrap up? So you have a mm -hmm. moment that's very strikingly visual in your play. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about like your thought process and converting that into an audio, an, uh, an oral moment? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, there was one, uh, yes. So the play's about Marie Curie and another scientist who is her friend, Herta Ayrton. And Marie is, one of the kind of three lines is that she is, obsessing almost like you do about a lover about um, radium and the radioactivity that she is responsible for the science of bringing about that into the world. And so there's a moment when she is, and this is true, she kept a vial of radium around her all the time. Um, 
less less of a good idea in retrospect. But um, and so there's one scene that she kind of holds it, and it's nighttime by herself. She's not supposed to have it, but she's holding it, and it's glowing, and it's really beautiful. And it's a gorgeous stage moment. And basically, I was like, I want that moment. I know it can't live in an audio play, so the live production has that moment, and the audio play just kind of takes a bit of a breath. Like there's a little bit of space in the in the recording, and it kind of goes back, but you don't. Because I was like, do we give her a monologue about holding it and the light and the blah, 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 blah. Do we have a narrator come in and be like, she holds it closely. It is blah, 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 blah. Do we have the other character be like, I see you holding that. <laughs> Radiant just, suddenly becomes a character and it's like, hello. Radiant's am- like, hey, girl. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no. All of the versions were pretty terrible. So I just kind of was like, well, maybe this is me just going, that's a theater and this is an audio and we'll just let them be different, which I think is fine too. Um, and I was, again, the, the great, gift of being able to do it on stage as well as, as an audio thing. Um, so I will just, since we're, we're done, oh man, I could talk to you all forever. Thank you one more time for doing this. I would love, um, I know some of your stuff is accessible right now in this digital world. Um, would you tell us if there's anything that, how folks can find your work besides buying scripts and reading them? Um, I know, Madhuri, is your, your show is still, um, is still being streamed right now? The one in- um, No, I don't think so. Antigone? There was, no, Antigone uh, was last week. Um, was so good. Yeah, it was, we had a, I've had th- a th- like, there was um, a play, of, a production of House of Joy got shut down and they, they um, released the uh, dress rehearsal video, which was beautiful. Um, in Love and Warcraft was supposed to be done by the ACT acting students and Peter Quo just transformed it into a Zoom production, which was so fucking great. amazing. It was so good. Um, it was phenomenal. It was like, it gave one of the few things that gave me a lot of hope about us as a species was seeing that Zoom production. Um, and then we had a wonderful um, Zoom reading slash kind of reprisal of uh, another play of mine that got shut down. Mm-hmm. Uh, Antigone presented by the girls of St. Catherine's, which went up at Sacred Fools in LA. All really wonderful stuff. Nothing really streaming right now. Uh, you can except find my, for your audio show. <laughs> except for except for Evil Eye. Listen to Evil Eye. It, it's it's okay. it's available anytime, anywhere for your ears. <laughs> and all and uh, my plays are either available on Samuel French or they're available on newplayexchange.org. So you can find them there. Oh great, yes, another new play exchange plug. Mm-hmm. What's how can we find your work, Chisa? Uh, if you just go to my website, hey, www.chisahutchinson.com. I try to keep it updated, although lately I've been like, eh, everything is suspended indefinitely. I don't know when productions are going to happen again, or when the world will start spinning again. So, meh. Um, but I have been posting, um, uh, like uh, the subject, the the film um, that got made, um, yes. basically that I wrote at Tish, um, <laughs> that is making the festival rounds right now. And I know a lot of those are going digital. Oh so yeah, great point. Trying to, we've done a couple, two festivals. We So far we have at least seven more um, to go. And I know that a few of those are gonna be digital. Awesome. Um, so I will be posting those dates as soon as I have them on my website on the website awesome y'all this was so great thank you so 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 much thanks to audible for encouraging this and giving us a reason to write some audio plays thank you lauren for giving us an excuse to hang out oh yeah likewise (laughs) we should do this with like cocktails everything y'all like about this yeah we should do this again um all right thank you so much and uh thanks everybody for watching i'll go back through the comments like i usually do and answer stuff if that's helpful and um forward you to other people who are smarter than i am if i don't know what i'm talking about <laughs> um thanks so much everybody thank you jesus thank you Madhuri. thanks everybody